you want to know how to get an 800 lens, that's it right there. You get rid of your boat that you were paying <laughs> that you were paying $800 a month storage, winterize it and use it how many months a year? Just dump that thing. I was shooting a Canon 500 for I don't know how many years. And uh, when the 800 came out, I looked at the price, of course, and initially I thought, well, there's no use even investigating it because I didn't want a 600 because they were so heavy. When the 800 came out, I thought, well, I don't want that either because it has to be even heavier. And I got ready to go to Alaska one year and Mary Mannix from Canon had dinner with her and was offered to send me an 800 to take up there. And I said, well, I'm not strong enough to carry it. So I passed on it. And then that fall in Yellowstone, we were photographing and there was a guy next to me that had an 800 and uh, don't, don't do this today. I'll just, I said, man, do you mind if I look through that? <laughs> and then I lifted it, it wasn't, wasn't that heavy. And so when I got home, I looked it up and it was only a pound and a half heavier than the 500 I was using because they went to the titanium body. And uh, the wheels started turning and the rest was history. And I've never looked back. I want to thank um, Eric Stoner from Canon for inviting me and um, setting up so I could be here today. I've used Canon cameras ever since clear back the AE-1 program film camera. From there, I went to their first autofocus camera, the 650, the 620s, and then the EOS-1, the, um, what was that, eight frames a second with film, and then waited and waited and waited for Canon to come out with their first digital camera, which was the D30, not 30D, the D30, 3.25 megapixel, then the D60. I, my wife and I were photographing the unlimited hydroplane race in Indianapolis or in uh, on the um, uh, Ohio River, and I was shooting the digital camera, and she was um, no, she was shooting the digital camera, and I was shooting the film camera, and. After a few boats went by and we'd just gotten there and we were just practicing, figuring it all out, she wanted to try that film camera. And the first boat that went by, eight frames a second with film, she just unloaded a whole roll of film. And I looked at her and I said, honey, you can slow that down a little bit. And she looked at me and she says, why would I want to do that? <laughs> so I had two bricks of film. I had to go out and buy two more bricks of film. <laughs> So I created a monster. <laughs> so I, then I got into the uh, Canon 1DS bodies. I, I'm a, I have a, a portrait studio, so I always was buying the camera that they made that had the full frame and the higher megapixels because I was used to shooting 4x5 um, and the RZ and the 645 um, and the Mamiya's. Then from there was the... 1DX Mark II, the 1DX Mark III. Once I got into the, uh, no, not the 1DX, the 1DS 1, 2, and 3, and now the 1DX and the 1DX Mark II. And all of those cameras, believe it or not, I would buy them two at a time because when you're in business, you need two cameras. And I always wanted two cameras with the same file size. I didn't want to be thinking about, well, what am I going to put on this body? What am I going to put here and that? So could I afford it? No, I just did it. Um, <coughs> each version gets better in features, but the main features I was always look, looking for was more megapixel horsepower, better ISO noise, to shoot those high ISOs and better autofocus because everything I do 
is on AI servo tracking. It's uh, wildlife and children, you know, I, uh, tracking. Um, so every version, the, the upgrades are always worth it. You can go online uh, when all the specs first come out and the cameras um, haven't been introduced yet and you're going to study all the specs and get all the um, chatter on, on the websites and everything, but I don't have to tell you guys that the upgrades are always worth it. The, especially now, even from, from the 1DX to the 1DX Mark II, the um, autofocus and, and the noise. Now, as far as noise is concerned, when I was shooting the 1DS Mark III, I shot all my wildlife at 800 and 1600 successfully with the no, uh, noise. Now, the, the trick and the secret to that is your post-production. You've got to do some noise reduction when you get there. Once the 1DX came out, I default to 1600. I shoot 1600, 3200, and 6400 in the field. I'm shooting a 5.6 lens, it's slow, and then when I put a 1.4 teleconverter on it, now you're at f8. So I'm making up the difference in the uh, ISOs. And at 1600 and 3200, uh, the noise is no issue at all. I'm going to show you some uh, samples here. Um, and I, if I have to, I will go to 6400. Now, even on a bright sunny day, I, I'll still continue to shoot at 1600. And what I will do there, if I can afford the shutter speeds, now I will drop down to f8 because that's the sweet spot on the on this lens. And I use that uh, the micro focus adjustment and that software out there, that Focal or Focal. I'm not exactly sure how they pronounce it. That software that does the microfocus adjustment will also run you through um, algorithm to tell you the sweet spot on your lens. It prob probably wasn't uh, a far off guess anyway that it was either going to be F8, which is stop down one, or F11. On this lens, it came out to F8. And I, I really can tell the difference. So if I'm shooting at 16 and I have enough light, rather than drop down to 800, I will stop down to f8 when I'm shooting, so I get that extra sharpness in there. Um, I do a lot of programs, and um, whenever I'm invited, the first thing I ask them is how much time they're going to give me, and I always like a whole day. And even that, when I leave after a whole day, I'm frustrated. Oh, I didn't have time to tell them this. Oh, I didn't have time to tell them that. We have two hours, <laughs> so we're, we're going to get right straight to the meat. Um, one lady said she's only going to be here an hour, and I told her that I was going to tell her all the good stuff in the first hour. Um, I'm going to get right straight to the heart of what, when I lecture, the main thing I want to get out there, and that is how to get your images as sharp as possible. and. I have a theory and a technique. I didn't come up with the technique, but I it modified it and enhanced it and um, figured out how it works. And I'm going to tell you what I, how I do it and what I do. Go home, try it. Whether you continue to use it, fine. I don't care. I'm going to tell you what works for me. And if it works for me, it's the right thing. <laughs> when I first started shooting um, a 500 millimeter lens, I would take it out and my, my images weren't sharp. And I, I'd been around photography all my life, so I, start, I shot it with a cable release, and you can't shoot wildlife with a cable release. I don't care what anybody says. I, you can, um, but, and I even tried it with a uh, remote control. 
mirror lockup, and you certainly can't do wildlife with mirror lockup. And my images were still soft. So I had to go in search of what I was doing wrong or what the problem was. So this was, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, information out there. I found one website, one web page where this guy explained long, it was called long lens techniques. And if you ever, if you own a long lens, or if you've ever been in the field and watch guys shoot with the long lens, they shoot like this, a hand up here and a hand on the camera. That's, that's how they shoot. You've seen that before. I know you have. And his, what he said in, this, in his uh, web post on this was that the reason you put your hand up here is because there's a, he says there's a wave of vibration when you fire. That wave of vibration goes up and comes back. And you put your hand up here to dampen that. Okay. I took it out and I tried it. And my images were sharp as a tack. Couldn't have been better. So I kept thinking about that and thinking about it. And I thought, how could he know there's a wave of vibration that goes up and come back, comes back? There's no way he could possibly know that. And so I kept tossing it around. And I finally came up with the answer. And the answer... I'm the only one that has figured it out. If you buy any camera book out here, um, and even some that were written a hundred years ago, and you guys that have been around, and even now, the technique is to use a mirror lockup with a cable release. And everybody knows that. Well, that's, that goes clear out the window. That's over. That's done. The books need to be rewritten. And since I'm not an author, it hasn't been rewritten yet. But here it is. When, those, when the books were written, all the cameras, the camera was mounted to the tripod. Now we're all shooting with a collar. All the 90%, unless we're doing landscape. Now, we're, not, we're talking about lenses with a collar. Where's the camera? It's floating in midair back here. And I don't care, look at that. I don't care how good a tripod you have, and this is the best one you can buy with a $750 head. Look at that vibration. And if you're using a cable release, you're recording all that vibration. So his technique was correct, but his theory was wrong. He's probably watching. <laughs> he, he, all he has to do is change his blog and we're good to go. Now, with this Wimberly head, the way this is set up, and you guys know this, this is balanced on here. If I, put a teleconverter on it, I have to change the balance point with this tongue and groove system right here. So this is balanced. All right, if I push down in the front, the back comes up. If I pull down in the back, the front comes up. So when you're shooting, you're going to push down in the front, pull down in the back, and, and squeeze the trigger, squeeze the fire button. It can't vibrate anymore. And I'm talking about get into it, push down, pull down. Your images will be so sharp, you won't believe how sharp they are after that. Now, take it one step further. Once I started shooting like that, I have a portrait studio. And when I'm in the studio, the studio is dark and I have strobes. And I could be shooting at 60th of a second. But you're actually, in a, in a dark studio, you're shooting at the speed of light. Because once those strobes go off, the exposure is over. So at 100 ISO, at 60th of a second, they're, tax, they're so sharp, you have to soften them when you're doing portraits. 
I could take that same camera and that same lens outside, use a cable release and mirror lockup with a 70 to 200 lens doing, doing portraits outside, and they were soft. Well, you're recording the ambient light now because you're, you're outside. And so once I used that same technique doing portraits, now with portrait lens, you don't, have, you don't have to put your hand on the top, but your subject is holding still. You're gonna lock down your ball head and put your left hand, I don't care where, it doesn't matter where you put it, you can put it on top of the lens if you want. Just hold that tripod steady, pull down on that camera to eliminate that vibration that's happening from here to here and shoot. Forget the cable release. The cable release is a detriment to you, in my opinion, when you're using a collar like this because you're recording that vibration. Once I started doing that with the outdoors with the portrait um, lens and, and the, they were just as sharp as what I was doing with this. Now, I'm gonna show you a sample. Everybody knows, everybody knows the, um, the, uh, the rule, the, the focal length, this is for hand holding, the focal length of the lens and what shutter speed you use. So what is it, a focal length of 100? You should be somewhere around, what, 125? Yeah, that, that, that rule is for hand holding, and that was even before stabilizers were made, I believe, that, that rule came out. So uh, let me show you a sample here. Now this is shot with this 800. That's 45th of a second, 145, with an 800 millimeter lens using that technique for sharpness. Now you're not gonna shoot very much at 145th of a second, but you never know. So I brought one sample. I've gone as low as 30th of a second with an 800. That's not supposed to happen. Um, and I wish I had a sample of the same exact thing shot with a cable release. Now, when I see, when I'm in the field and there are other photographers around and they're shooting a long lens and I see them trying to shoot wildlife with a cable release, I don't say anything, but it screams to me, they're saying, my images are soft. My images are soft. That's why they're out there trying to do wildlife with a cable release. That, to me, that's what it's, what it's saying. Now, once I figured it out to steady this like that, now, when I'm in the field, I, I go even further. With these long lenses, this lens, this is just the hood, you know that. And I don't just put this on any old place. I have it marked and it, I lock it down right there because I use that knob and this is the way I shoot. I don't put my hand on the top. I put my hand here. I hook my finger over it. I get this arm up under this I pull down in the front and I pull down in the back. And the reason I use this is because I'm shooting something that's either going to run or fly once it decides to move. And once it decides to move, I need total control over the camera movement. So then I take this and I pinch it and I have total control over the front of the camera. I've got the back in the front to track. Now once you're tracking something like that, your shutter speed better be high enough to freeze anyway. We're talking about in general this technique, but 
this is how this is the technique that I use at that point to to control that camera by using that knob right there. Now, I've been 15 years lecturing on that technique. I just believe in it that much. <laughs> and I tell it to everybody. And I'll tell it to anybody that will listen because I just believe it. Um, I have kind of a crazy last name, Shigaris. So maybe they'll name this technique after me. It's not as bad as Scheinflug, and they named <laughs> that four by five after him. The shine, you know what the Scheinflug technique is for getting everything sharp from front to back. So maybe they'll name it after me when I'm gone. Who knows? Somebody will probably take the idea, but that's okay as long as people use it. All right. Now, the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about today is um, I already talked to you about um, high ISOs, and um, I want to just I want to show you some samples of the high ISOs and, and the noise. All right, let me let me get out of this first. Okay, this is shot at 3200 with the uh, the 1DX Mark II. I'm pretty sure that's what it would I uh, shot this with. And we'll get these. This is the same one with and without post processing. So you can see. All right. This one, you can see the noise. And okay, on the monitor, there's more noise than you're going to see on your computer screen. Let me. Let me get it down. On your computer screen, that noise is going to look like that. So it, it's totally different than on this uh, screen that we're looking at here. Now, if you look at the noise in the elk, it's, it's exactly the same. That noise is exactly the same because for the most part, that's about what you're. That's about what that noise is going to look like on your computer screen. Now, you won't see that noise in fur or feathers. And if you're photographing wildlife, all your subjects have fur and feathers. The fur and the feathers are so textured. You don't see the noise. You'll see the noise in the open areas and in the shadow areas. That noise lives in the uh, shadow areas. It blue, lives in that blue channel in that digital file. That's where your noise lives in there. And so what I do is I photograph, and then in post-production, I do a um, Photoshop technique that cancels out all that noise. Now, when you, when you use a filter, a noise filter in Photoshop, when you use a noise filter in Photoshop, it's global. It goes all over your subject, and it goes all over your... Um, the background goes all over everything. So what I do is you're going to make a duplicate layer, control J, command J, and then use your um, noise filter. And it doesn't matter what you use. Use the one built in Photoshop, reduce noise, use that, use I just happen to use this one by, um, is it Imagonics? Is it Noiseware, if I'm pronouncing it correctly? Now, it has all these sliders and everything in here. I don't mess around with those. I go up here. I find a preset, stronger, strongest, whatever one is, whatever one 
takes out that noise. Now you see how it mushed up your subject and you don't want that to happen. All it's doing is blurring that, blurring that image to get rid of it. Pick one that gets rid of the noise and click OK. Now, to speed things up when I work, I have an action that just says noise. And it uses the same settings every time. Now, after that, and let's look here. Let's look at the subject. See how we've lost detail in the subject? Well, you don't want that. So then what I do is you're going to want to make a mask and then the below that layer, below this layer, is a layer with no noise filter on it. So you're going to take the mask, you're going to get your paintbrush tool, uh, paintbrush tool, at 100%. The mask is white. You're going to get on that mask, make sure where that mask is selected. You're going to pick black because it's hide and reveal. And you're going to rough this in. And you do not have to be that accurate. Just try to stay inside your subject. And you're going to, you're cutting that mask. You can see right here where I've cut into that mask. You're going to draw that all the way around, come down into the legs. You can be more accurate than I'm being right now. For the sake of time, I'm roughing this in. But it does not have to be that accurate. Now, let's go in and look at just that mask. That mask looks like that. As long as this is, there's no openings in this. Now, I could go in and draw all of this until it's all black. But for the sake of time, what you're going to do is you're going to come over here where the gradient, gradient tool is, and you're going to grab the paint bucket tool. And you want to set this tolerance to 230 up here. This, that, that's going to be a must. Set your tolerance to 230. And then with that paint bucket tool, you're going to come inside here and click. Now let's go in and look at that mask again. I just, I just filled that mask. Now it's going to leave, let me zoom up. Sometimes it leaves this line like that. Don't worry about it. Believe me, nobody is, can see that. Because all that is is right, you're not going to see it. So now what you have is you brought back the sharpness you brought back the sharpness to your image, to your subject that has fur and feathers, but you've softened all the noise back here. And that could be your sky, that could be anything that's open. Now, let me back up from where I clicked that. Uh, all right, if you're moving quickly and you wanna, you've got the paint uh, brush selected and you're ready to fill that, you don't have to come down here and grab the paint bucket tool, click, and then go back over and get the paint brush tool. You don't have to do that. You've got the brush selected. Just hold down the G. If you look right here under the paint bucket, see how it says G? That's the keyboard shortcut. So you're going to be on the paint brush tool, G, click. And now you're right back. Well, somehow I did, didn't click in there, right? But you get the idea. I think I, I think I drew on my. <coughs> Let's get back. You're on your brush. G, click. And there you have it that quick. And you save that and you can move on to the next one. Now, what I do, let's say I have 300 images that I want to do that to. I've built an action. And what that action will do, it will make a duplicate layer, make right here. It will run the noise filter. It will create the mask. It will pick 
my paintbrush tool and it will set the colors so that black is the default. So it does all that for me. All I have to do is go in and start drawing the mask. So I do a lot of shooting at high ISOs. Now, I want to talk to you some more um, about um, how I set my camera. When I'm doing wildlife photography, everything is about speed. How, because things are happening in front of you and you don't have time to mess around. Now, a lot of uh, wildlife photographers, um, they swear and they, they totally believe in back button focus. Now, I use back button focus in my studio a lot because that way if I focus and recompose and I decide not, not to take the shot because I have to uh, tweak the pose a little bit, when, when it's time to do the uh, shot, if I've taken my hands off the camera using the fire button to focus, I have to focus and recompose again because now the focus point's hitting them in the chest and not in the eyes. So I'll use the back button in the studio. So once, it's, once I have that composition and I fire, I'm not changing the focus. Years ago, um, when they came out with you, uh, that allowed you to do that, I've been doing that in the studio for a long time. Then, before people were doing back button focus um, for wildlife, I had, for me, I had already tried it and ruled it out. And here's why I ruled it out. When I'm focusing, if I focus with the back button, when I would go to fire, I would catching myself jerking the, the shot. If I focus with the fire button and then fire, I'm halfway down. I've prepped, I've prepped that fire button. I'm halfway down and then all I have to do is touch it off. Well, the guys that use back button focus, what they like to do is they will, they will hold that in to focus and then if their subject stops, they take their finger off of that if they want to recompose or to keep the AI servo from pulsating, they take their finger off of that button because it's the same. When you take their, your finger off, it's the same as flipping the switch from autofocus to manual. It turns the focusing motor off. I do just the opposite. I program this back button to turn the focusing motor off. So I focus with the fire button, I fire with the fire button, and if I, my subject stops, or if, if I want to focus and recompose, I hold this button in, and then I can recompose because that shuts the focusing motor off. I'm still on AI servo tracking, and when my subject flies or runs, all I have to do is take my finger off of that button, the motor is now re-engaged and I'm tracking again and when I fire I'm already halfway down and I don't catch myself jamming that down with excitement because I've already prepped that fire button. Now I'm not I got I have photographer friends that swear their images are sharper by holding that in the back it's just a switch. But it's their technique that they're comfortable with that's making, making the images sharper. Um, now, here's what else I do. I shoot in the field 90% of the time on aperture value. These lenses are slow. I have, most of the time I have to shoot them wide open. So I'm shooting it at 5.6 or f8. I let the meter <coughs> figure out the shutter speed. I have to keep an eye on it that it doesn't drop too low and then adjust, adjust with the ISO. So since you're still using the meter, you're not on uh, manual where you're, you're controlling both, you're going to be controlling your exposure with plus or minus exposure compensation. So. Let's say you had a, um, a juvenile bald eagle, dark bird, 
up in the sky, when you point that camera up there, that meter is going to get tricked by the bright sky. It's going to say, oh, it's really bright. It's going to shut down, and that bird's going to be too dark. It's going to get tricked. So you're going to be at plus one and a half, maybe even plus two on a dark bird like that. So while you're photographing that bird and it comes down and it, you're at plus two and it comes down and now it has a woods behind it, now you're totally over, going to overexpose it because you're at plus two. You've got it in the viewfinder tracking it. You don't have time to change the plus two. Even if you're th that wheel back here, you're going to spin that wheel. You don't have time to do that. I program this camera so that wherever I am, plus one, plus two, minus one, minus two, wherever I am, if I press this exposure lock button, this one right in the middle, it zeroes that compensation out. So I'm at zero compensation. I can continue to fire. If it goes back up into the sky again, I can take my finger off of that and I'm back up to wherever I had it set. So I'm getting speed out of that as well. Now, when, when this is on AI servo tracking, if I have a subject that stops, that, and I want it, this camera to be on one shot, I don't have time to reach up here and change it to one shot. This camera, this lens has buttons right here. I even folded this back so I can get to these buttons. Now you program those buttons, whatever choices, the camera gives you a lot of choices for that. I program, now each button does the same, so that if you're here, it, you don't program each button, you program it and any one you push does the same. When I push one of these buttons, I can look here in the top, and this goes from servo to one shot. One shot means when I press that fire button, that camera will go beep beep, and I can recompose. So speed is everything. When I push that button, won't focus that close. Still, well, it's switches to one shot. Now, if I'm using a lens, like let's say the 100 to 400, that doesn't have these buttons, and you want to switch quickly from one shot, uh, from servo to one shot, you've got two buttons here in the front, the depth of field button, then you can program both of these any way you want them, and work it with the longest finger, whichever finger is comfortable to reach that. I program one of these buttons so that when I push it in, it switches from servo to one shot so I can lock that focus in. Now, another thing, another setting that I use when it's, and again, it's all about speed. When you shoot, after you shoot, and you want, I program this, the camera, so that the picture does not come up on the LCD in the back until I tell it to. And in order to see that picture, I have to reach back here with this hand, and I have to push this button to bring the picture up. And then I have to use this finger to magnify it. I don't have time to mess around with all that. I want to see it right away. So I program this set button so that when I push that, that picture comes up. And not only does that picture come up, but it comes up right where the focusing square was immediately. And then if I push it again, it shows me the entire image. Now the reason I do that is so that I, my, usually my subjects aren't filling the whole, the whole frame. In wildlife, they're far away usually, or there's little tiny little birds or something. 
and I'm gonna, we're gonna go in and I'm show you some images I have of how to set that, to do that. That, you will set this button to magnify at actual size. Then you have to program it and you'll have to get, read your manual. You'll have to program it, not only actual size, but you'll want it to, when, you, when it magnifies to actual size, you'll want to be looking right where your focusing square is because if you, for composition, you move the square down in the corner, you don't want the actual size to come up over here somewhere. And once it's up, you can spin the wheel and you don't have to see the whole thing. You can back up on it. Now, the problem that I have here is uh, this button br turns it on but it won't turn it off. And when I'm shooting, I don't want to have to bring this hand away from what I'm doing to turn it off. So I merely, went, and to save battery life, to turn it off, I just push the ISO button. The ISO button shows 1600 down in the corner, but that's not going to eat up as much battery life as if I left that burning back there. So I just touch that and you've just gotten rid of it. Now another thing that I do a lot is I use this button back here and your cameras have a microphone built in them. And I use that all the time. We were just up in Maine photographing Acadia and the lighthouses and you bring an image up and let's say I bracketed well, when I get home and I have a series there, I want to know that the last three images or the last five images are part of that bracket. Well, you call up the last image, and while that image is on the screen, you can hold that down, last three images bracketed. When I get home, I'm going to have a wave file with the same exact frame number. This is frame 9522. I'm going to have a WAV file, 5922. And I'll play that WAV file and I'll know exactly. If I wanted to do some tests, I could call it up. You used to have to write stuff down with the filter, without a filter. With the stabilizer, without the stabilizer. Anything you'd want to do quickly in the field, I use that microphone back there for everything. And the best, bird photographers, I use the Dick Cheney method. Maybe I shouldn't say this. <laughs> you shoot first and identify later. <laughs> so I photograph, I go, I go where the birders are up on Lake Erie, McGee Marsh, the bird in the spring, biggest week in birding and I photograph this little warbler and I don't have a clue what it is. Next birder that comes by that looks like he knows what he's doing, I would say, man, what is that? When he tells me what it is, I turn on the microphone and I say it, because you're not going to remember it, I guarantee you. So I use that microphone all the time. Okay, this is one of the best features to come along is to allow, th this is favorites, this is like your browser. I, I use this as like religion. This is the best. Now, you, you, you find your favorites, but you also, once you put your favorites in here, you have to tell the camera that when you push the menu button, it will default to that screen. If not, when you push the menu button, it will default to the very first menu in the menu. So you're going to save stuff to your favorites, but you have to set it to default to that screen. Alrighty? Now, the best thing for me that they ever came up with was load and save. Save to the card, start, 
And this is going to be the file name right here. Unless you choose change file name. And when I'm in the field, I don't have time to mess with that. So what I do is I just save it generically. Or if I make a new landscape one, I won't type, go down in there and try to type in landscape. I'll just put L. It has to have eight characters. So I'll put L11111 until I fill up eight characters. Then if I tweak some other settings, I'll save again. I'll say L22222. When I get home, I'll take those, that file, the, the last one, because okay, I've got all my settings tweaked the way I want them. I, if they're on the card. I can go in there. I can name that landscape, which is more than eight characters, but just make it eight characters. And then, once you do that, it's on your, it's on your uh, card. You can copy those to your computer, and you can copy those to all your cards. Now, why do I do that? Because there's the settings that I have, and, now, and I, have, I would have another one that says uh, landscape. So I get up in the morning and I go out and I take a hike for a few hours and I'm photographing wildlife and I come back and I have to do a portrait setting. Well, for portraits, I'm going to use back button focus, 100 ISO, 60th of a second, F11, and all the settings that I want. I don't want to have to sit and monkey around with all that. I just go in here and I uh, load settings and I pick load, wildlife, busy, Good to go. I was photographing landscape one time in Yellowstone, and I looked over, and there was a grizzly bear swimming across this river. And everybody's looking this way, photographing the landscape. I didn't say anything to anybody. I just backed out, went over, put on a long lens, did this. In 10, 12 seconds, I have all my wildlife settings. And I left everybody standing there, and I was photographing this grizzly bear after he got out of the water. Well, now, what you'll do is you set up your default settings. So my default setting is 1600 ISO. And I know that at no compensation. So now I look at the scene, and I go, it's dark. Uh, so all I have to do is tweak it to 3200 and maybe uh, plus one, and I'm shooting. If I was shooting landscape and I had to go in and do all those, that tweaking, never get it. So that's my favorite thing right there is to load and save settings. Now, if you are from the school where when you put your cards back in the camera, you format them each time, you're not going to be able to do that because that's going to delete all those settings. I happen to be from the school that I put the card back in the camera, I erase the images that are on there. That's a total different topic that we don't have time to talk about and never arrive at a solution anyway. I'll just give you the short version, and I've talked to SanDisk, I've talked to Lexar, I've, and uh, the one way to sum it up, you know, um, you don't format your hard drive every time you delete things off of it. I rest my case. And I've been doing it since the very first Canon camera. Now, in the back, let me back up. All right, here, I don't have all the menus. I have some others. These, I did these, um, I think with the 1DX, you got one page. With the 1DX Mark II, you can have a page and then right here is a, a, you can, another button, and you can toggle over. You can have different pages, and you can keep putting your favorites in those. I only have screenshots of um, initially what I had set up. Um, tracking sensitivity. This is another one that's in my favorites. This is tracking sensitivity. I shoot almost exclusively on minus two. Now what that is, is if, that, if I'm on my subject and something runs in front or in between, if you were doing 
football and you were locked on your subject and, and another player ran in between, it wouldn't jump to that other, that servo tracking would not jump to that other player. When I'm shooting wildlife, I keep it on minus two so it doesn't change as fast. Reason being, it, let's say, and this, this has happened to me, I'm photographing these two coyotes that are fighting and they're in tall sage. A focusing sensor is right on them. Then they'd get in that uh, tall grass and then out, and in the tall grass and out, just they were moving. I didn't want that focusing center to jump to, it will jump to the nearest subject, which was gonna be that grass, and then back onto them. It waits for a second before it updates. And I'm doing little birds too, and they might move and there'll be a limb or a, or a leaf or something. I don't want it changing, but I have it in my favorites so that I can change it if I want to. But I shoot almost exclusively on minus two so that those blades of grass, leaves, limbs get in front of my subject, it doesn't update quite so fast. Another one that I keep in my favorites is the autofocus um, areas. Now, this one is not updated. There should be a check box right here. When, when I go to pick, do I want to use just one focusing sensor or these assists? This, this one is the nine in the center that I'll use for birds in flight. <coughs> and there should be a check box here. This I, is called the uh, slang term ring of fire. I'll use that for birds in flight if I can't hold them with that nine. Now, one focusing sensor on a small bird in flight, most of the time you can't hold it. One is the best because one is the most accurate and one, the, uh, it, the computer doesn't have to think, it doesn't have to calculate, doesn't have to jump around. When you get to the ring of fire, it's easier to hold your subject in there, but now you're relying on that computer to calculate and update, and you'll see those sensors in there. So nine, those nine in the center are the best. Well, with these cameras, when I go to select them, I don't use this one and I don't use this one. No, yeah, you can't take out just a single point, but the spot you can. So I don't use the spot and I always use the single point, so when I go to toggle through them, they're not even there. I don't even see them. Speed, quicker, all righty? Now, white balance. Ever since the very first Canon camera, the very first, and I've owned all their, their high-end cameras, I shoot everything on cloudy. I default to cloudy. Yes, when I get in a tungsten setting and I'm going to do a lot of shooting in tungsten, I'll shoot them at tung on, I'll set it to tungsten. I know how to do custom white balance if I'm doing commercial photography and that color is 100%. I know how to, you know, for the client, I know how to do custom white balance. But I'm shooting portraits and wildlife. And I shoot everything on cloudy. You can fix it. You not fix it, you can adjust it in your raw file converter, whatever one you use. But what I have found, cloudy is the most accurate for everyday shooting. I use um, studio strobes. I have old Novatrons for um, fill light, background light, and I use um, photogenic power light 600s. I've shot cloudy all my portraits for years. Image review, I told you I have that off until I push that button to turn it on. All right, in this camera I have uh, AI servo image priority. I set it to focus. I'm not a photojournalist. I, if it's not in focus, I don't want it anyway. I set that for focus priority and um, second image priority is also set to focus. And you can see the little uh, triangle on the far right is set to plus as far as it'll go, plus two. 
one shot um, autofocus is also set to focus. Lens drive, continuous focus. In other words, if my lens gets lost, I want it to keep hunting. And here's why. If, if I'm focused close and then I have a bird way up and it's focused close, it's so out of focus, I won't even be able to see that bird if I am looking at it. It's so blurry, you won't even see it. What I do at that point is I will put the lens on a far horizon line, trees, focus on that, and then go back up to the bird, and it's going to be off a little bit, but you'll at least now see him in the viewfinder so you can lock on him, okay? And um, the orientation, wherever that square is, my focusing square, if it's up in this left-hand corner, when I go to vertical, I want it to be in the same spot. I don't, that's just me. I don't want to have to be hunting for that thing. So it's going to be, that's the way I set that up. The, um, the initial autofocus select, when I have that, um, those nine in there, I want it to pick wherever, if I have that ring of fire, it's still going to show you a little square in there to get started. I want it to start right there. Now here's what I was showing you. You want to set, if you program this back button to show you your picture and you want it to come up actual size, here's where you set it in that menu right there. Magnify actual size. And where you, where you will find that is when you go in this setting to program those buttons on the back. So you'll find the set button, and then when you find that set button, when you go in there, you'll find the magnify for an actual size. You'll program that from there. And I'm gonna show you in just a minute why that's critical to bring that up right there. We're gonna talk about that in just a minute. There, actual size. When you go in there, it's going to say, which one do you want to pick? And you're going to say actual size from selected point right there. Now, the grid. I leave the grid. This has an electronic grid in it. So when I'm looking through there, I've got a grid. I leave that on all the time. It's built into the camera now. It's an electronic grid. Before it was built into the camera, I used to buy a, the grid screens for all the other cameras and for several reasons. The number one reason that I needed those grids is because if you try to do portraits, a 35 millimeter camera is an 8 by 12 frame. People buy 8 by 10s. I need that grid because those outside lines is the eight by ten, four by five, eight by ten, and relatively sixteen by twenty crop. So if you're going to do a large group, you better not have those people clear out to the edge. You just shot yourself in the foot. You need to have them inside that group, that those first, those those outside grid lines. The other reason I use the grids is because when I'm doing a landscape and I need that horizon level, you can turn the level on and mess around with that, but sometimes you don't have time to even mess around with that. You can just see the, the grid in there, and when that grid is lined up with your horizon, then you got it. And another reason I use that grid is because if I'm using the servo tracking, and I'm using that ring of fire, I, I need to know basically where that ring of fire is going to be. And that grid helps me know in there. And also, if you move your, your focusing point, let's say off one to the left or off one to the right, sometimes you will look in there and you won't realize that you've moved it over or moved it up or down. With that grid, you know where the center is all the time. 
So I leave that. I just leave that grid on. Now my personal, the way I shoot, my IS, uh, my exposure increments. I shoot in half stops. I don't shoot in thirds. I shoot in half stops because. I'm going to be closer than that anyway, and the the raw file has that much latitude, and I just don't want to when I when I change it, I want to change it. I don't. I'm not interested in thirds. That's just me personally. I shoot my ISO in whole stops. I shoot 100, 200, 400, 800, 16, 32, 64. I shoot in whole stops. That's just, that's just me. That's the way I do it. All right, restricted shooting modes. Speed in the field. I shoot in two. I shoot in aperture value and manual. If I, I, I default to aperture value so that the meter is working, I control it with the exposure compensation. When do I go to manual? I go to manual if my subject is sticking around or portraits, they're sticking around, and I have total control. The subject is all I care about. I don't care about the background, the exposure on the subject. Now, I only go to manual if that light is totally consistent, if it's an all cloudy day or if it's an all blue day but if it's a partially cloudy and the sun is coming and going coming and going coming and going you may have to you have to stick to aperture value because the lights changing all the time and speed is the name of the game now if my subject is sticking around and I have a consistent light let's say it's all nice and overcast the exposure is not changing but my subject is moving around. Let's say I'm photographing a fox den, and those little babies are running all around. And they're in a dark background, a light background, a neutral background. All the background's changing all the time. As I point the camera to those different backgrounds, the meter is changing. The meter is changing. But the light on the subject is not changing. Figure out your exposure. Go to manual, lock it in, and it doesn't matter what your background looks like. The subject is going to be identical because you've already determined. So when you're doing portraits, the only thing you care about in a portrait is the mask of the face. If you have the proper exposure on the face, you don't care about the background. You, I mean, you care about it. And if you're using strobe, you have control over it. But you get my drift. So, since I only use those two modes for wildlife, when I'm switching between them, I lock the rest of them out. So when I press this mode button, I only have two choices, because that's all I'm going to use. Drive restriction for wildlife, and I have to update this. This was with the 1DX, and I, you notice I have this one. This is silent. And the 1DX would only do one frame in silent, so I didn't use it. Now, the 1DX Mark II gives me multiple frames, high speed, not as high a speed as the regular high speed, but I use that, that silent mode all the time. Because when I'm doing little birds or wildlife that are up close, that shutter will scare them. That silent mode, they won't even look. So now I have it programmed that I can get to that silent high because I use it all the time. It's not as fast, but it's better than scaring your subject off. And I love it. That silent mode is, is terrific. And here's the microphone that we talked about. Now, I'm going to talk to you now about another one of my big pet peeves in photography. I'm a great believer in ignoring the histogram. I don't pay any attention to it. I don't pay any attention to it at all. Oh, I will look at it, some, even in Photoshop, I don't pay any attention to it. 
I might look at it while I'm working on an image, but I don't, I don't pay any attention to it. I do all my exposures with this Hoodman. This is the original, the small one, Hood Loop or Hoodman. If you don't own one of these, you can buy one of these before you leave the store. I still use the small one because it fits right in this little pouch that um, you can't buy anymore. But you get you a pouch that it will fit in nicely. Uh, this one was made by Night Eyes Bass Pro Shop. And I wear it right here. And when I shoot, it's right, and I don't zip it. And it, this little pouch, just luckily, it doesn't fall out. People say, oh, hey, your, your zipper's open. No. <laughs> uh, look, I shoot, and look, I can get this out and put it away. I don't, it, it will hang around your neck. That's OK, too. I just, I want it right here. So I have a subject out there, and you initially will dope the scene. And let me stop just for a second. I'm going to change thought process, and we're going to come back to the loop. I shoot 100% in evaluative metering. I don't go to spot, partial, none of the others. I shoot 100% <coughs> evaluative metering, and here's why. First of all, there's too many other things to think about. Second of all, when I'm photographing wildlife, some, a lot of times it's, they're small and they're moving or they're flying. If you're on spot, <coughs> spot metering or any of those other meterings, if you can't hold it right underneath that focusing point, then it's going to shift that meter. With evaluative, and you use it only, you will learn it. I can look up and say, that's a white bird with the sun shining on it. it. It might not need any exposure compensation at all, and I'll fire a couple shots. I can look at that white snow with a, a snowshoe hair white rabbit on it, and I can say, I, I better be at plus two. I can look at a neutral scene. You'll learn to evaluate that scene and get yourself quickly in the ballpark. If you're constantly jumping around from spot to partial to this to that, you're going to be confused. And you've got too many other things to think about and too many other buttons to push. Learn one thing and stick with it. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be faster at evaluating the exposure on those scenes. So what I will do, I, I initially, I'll evaluate a scene. I'll say I probably better be at a plus one. I'll fire a shot. I'll reach down here. I hit this to come up. If it's a small little subject, this comes up. Only thing I can see is the subject right on it. I take this, I lay that up there, I evaluate the exposure, I can push the button quickly, see the entire scene, evaluate the exposure, make any exposure compensation adjustments, and continue firing. I may even at that point, if I, I may even shoot with it in my hand. Fire a few more shots, check it, double check it again, and then when I'm done, I'll just put that away and I'm done with it for, the, for then. Later on, I might, I can, I'll quickly check it again. That's the way I shoot. Now, why do I ignore the histogram? I'm not just going to tell you that, I'm going to show you why. In this scene, for, first of all, on the histogram, the only thing you care about on the histogram runs along the line down here. This tells you nothing. The spike is only how much of that density is in there. So this peak, this dark peak, that's his body. That's how much of that darkness is in there. Well, the critical thing here is going to be his antlers. Well, if, I, if you're in the field, this thing is only this big. And the sun is shining on it. And his antlers are those three little spikes right there. If you try to evaluate this scene quickly in the field and you see all this, if you shove this over by opening up your exposure, you're going to shove this white over and off. So if you ignore this and you zoom up, 
to that, that's what you're going to be seeing when you put that loop up there. You're going to be looking right at that. Now, you can see some detail right there. You can see it. You'll recover the rest. Now you're concerned with his body. His body is right, is right on. If you try to adjust at this point, you're going to mess it up. Now here's, there's the final shot. If I would have adjusted looking at that spike that might have thrown my determination off, you know, I determined it needs to go more to the right, I would lose all that detail in there. I, I didn't have any more to give. Now, the reason you want to use the loop, and you want to know what all those dots are? Those are gnats or flies. Those poor things get worn out. I tried to simulate what the back of your camera looks like with the sun shining on it. Now you're going to be trying to evaluate this little histogram on the back of the screen that's only this big. If you are a believer in that histogram, look at it with this loop because it will block out all that light. If you still want to go down that, don't just look at it with all that. And you know what that looks like with, on a bright sunny day. You cannot see it. Same as looking at your image. Buy one of these. They're what, 80 bucks, give or take? I still use the small one. It, the new ones fill the whole screen in the back. I'm just going to look or move it around, one or the other. There's what that would look like on the back of your camera. That's what you would be evaluating. Now, here's another one, the wood duck. If you saw that in the field, you would bring that over. You, you would ruin your image. That's what it looks like in the camera through the loop. That's what it looks like in the camera through the loop. That's that same exact histogram. If, if I had moved that, I would have ruined it. And here's the final image that's been processed. If you would have relied on that histogram, you'd be done. You'd ruin that. Now, let me go one step further. This white right in here, you'd never want to expose for that. If that duck was right there, you wouldn't see detail in that. If you had an 80 power spotting scope, you wouldn't see detail in that white. Your eyes won't see it. Only photographers are going to look at that and say, there's no detail in that white. In life, in real life, there's no detail in that. So don't try to shoot for that. It's not going to work. Your same way when you photograph white birds, Many of those white birds in real life, if you go out there and you look at them, you don't see all that detail in those feathers. It's not there. And detail in the snow, unless you're looking right here, or there's waves or footprints that are picking up shadows, there, you go out next time, next year, on a, on a bright day, and you look out over a field, and you see how there's no detail in that snow. Your eyes can't see it. So it's frustrating um, when judging or when people are evaluating images. Oh, there's no detail in the snow. Oh, there's no detail in the blacks. There is a zone zero that's OK to have. There's a zone 10 or 255 that's OK to have. Those zones are legitimate zones. 
if you have a high dynamic range image, high dynamic range doesn't mean always detail in the blacks and always detail in the white. Clouds don't always have detail. Rushing water or a big wave can be zone 255 or zone 10. So a high dynamic range is going to go from 0 to 255. There can be a pure black in those, in those images. Okay, I'm going to give you another example. And this might be the best one. Evaluate that histogram on the fly. And you'll see what I'm talking about. We have to try to protect some of that white. That's a California condor. You have to try to protect some of that white in your exposure. Evaluate that in the, in the field, and you're going to move that over. All right. I'm going to show you what that looks like now. That's what it looked like in the back of the camera, right when it was shot, looking at it through a loop. That's what it looked like in the back of the camera, looking at it through the loop. Remember the histogram I showed you that was right in the mid-tone? This is what it looked like after I processed it. What would have happened if I would have relied on that histogram? That's the way I shot it and post-processed it. If I would have relied on that histogram, it would have been all over. Now, a lot of guys shoot with, they call them the blinkies. It, that's lying to you too. The first time Canon came out with their first cameras that let you, that showed those highlight blinks, I was photographing a wedding and all these digital cameras were new to me too. I hadn't come up with my own opinions yet and my own theories. I'm photographing a wedding. I have those blinkies on. I'm thinking this is the greatest thing that's ever happened. I have the groomsmen up there in black tuxedos. I fired the first shot with a flash and all this white right here started blinking. What did I do? I, adjust, I adjusted to get rid of that blink. I had one good frame of those groomsmen. The first one where it was blinking. Because the blinkies, they don't know what your subject is. It was the mask of their face that was the subject. I relied on that blinking. Well, if I was photographing the, and I saw that blinking, I'd be saying, oh, I got to change that. You rely on yourself with this loop. Your exposures, you'll nail them. You'll come home every time with perfect exposures. I guarantee it. Quit looking at it. When you're working in Photoshop and you move those level sliders around, you'll be looking at the, the levels in there. Look at that histogram in there. But it's your picture. You move those levels or curves controls. You'll, if, you'll know if you ruined it. You'll see it. Ignore that histogram and you put that picture where you need it and you want it. And in Photoshop, when you bring up levels or curves, it automatically makes a mask. So adjust the levels and curves that's global. And if you ruin one spot, you can take that mask and paint that data, mask that data out of that one spot. Now you're dodging and burning like we did in the old days. All right? I would show you I don't have time. If you don't own the Canon 100 to 400, the new one, it's a must have. You have to own that lens. I shot the old, the old version for 16 years. What you're looking at here, and again it looks pixelated because we're not looking at it on a monitor. Let me bring it back so well, you, you get the idea of what I'm going to tell you. This is handheld in a 16-foot boat 
while I was photographing loons with a 1.4 converter. That lens is that sharp. If you are shooting Canon and you don't own that lens, I highly recommend you save up and buy one. That's one of the finest lenses in their arsenal right now. Now, that lens, when I'm working in the field um, and I have large species animals that are relatively acclimated to people that will come in close, if I'm shooting a long lens, that 100 to 400, we call it a sidearm, it's, it's here. So that, for two reasons, if that species comes in close, this is too much, or now I've photographed it with this long lens, now I might want to do that same species with the mountains, or so, if it's a, it might be a moose, and I want to get the environment, I don't have time to switch, it's, you got a sidearm. That lens is so sharp, and with a one to four on it, you have a 560 millimeter, a 560 handheld. I highly recommend that lens. And I have a lot of friends, there's the same bird, handheld out of a boat. I have a lot of friends that are shooting it and everybody marvels over that lens. Now, through the years, I've had many conversations with people about the 2X teleconverter. I am a great believer in the 2X teleconverter. When I had a 300 2.8, which I had for 25, 30 years, and I sold mine, by the way, last year because I went a whole year, once I bought this 100 to 400, I went a whole year without using it. It wasn't long enough for me for wildlife, and I didn't need the 2.8 because with the new cameras I'm shooting at these high ISOs, I didn't need the 2.8. So I unloaded it to help myself buy a pair of 1DX bodies. Um, but I shot a 2X teleconverter. <laughs> I, I totally believed in it. In the field, I would hear all the time people, oh, I had one. I don't like it. I got rid of it. Okay, that was the end of the conversation. The trick to it is post-production. You must apply unsharp mask to that image. Now, I, I'm not using the 2X now because this is a 5.6 lens. When I put that on there, it now uh, goes to f11 and the camera won't autofocus. What I have discovered is if I use live view with a 2X, and I tap the back of that camera, it will autofocus. The 2X will autofocus, and then I can shoot. So I can't really track anything with it, but I could use it for a documentary on, on a long shot. Now, this camera won't autofocus. It will manual focus. It'll still shoot with it. This was a wolf in Yellowstone shot with a 2X teleconverter on this camera, I manually focus just to check the see if the quality would be there. Let me zoom in on him. And again, we're not getting the same. That's it, manual focus right there. The, the quality is there. You can get it. Now, the degree of difficulty goes up, and you can see what that's that's a 1600 millimeter the camera. 800 with a 2x. That's so you can still see how far away he is. That's still a long way. So the quality is there. Now here's another reason I'm going to tell you what you want to do when you're using your teleconverters, whether it's the 1.4 or the 2x. When you bring that file into Photoshop, you want to go into Unsharp Mask and sharpen that image. It's in focus. It, there's a difference between sharpen and focus. If an image is out of focus, you're not going to fix it. But you can sharpen a focused image. And when you're using your teleconverters, you want to go into Photoshop. Now, the settings that I use in Unsharp Mask, and this is all I use, I set the radius to 0.5. I never mess with the threshold. The threshold is zero. 
and I do all the sharpening with the percent slider. Not on portraits. On portraits, you're going to be anywhere from 50 to 100. You don't want portraits extra sharp. But with tabletop or wildlife, you can shove that percent slider as far up as you want to go until it looks right. Now I'll repeat those numbers for you. Radius is 0.5, and you're going to do everything with the uh, uh, percent slider. Now, when you're moving the percent slider, when do you stop? It's real simple. When it looks over sharpened, it is over sharpened. And if you start to see white edge line, you've over sharpened. That's that contrast line, you've over sharpened. Nothing will make your picture look more amateuristic then you'll, you'll ruin more pictures by over sharpening them any other method that, that you're going to do in Photoshop. Over, overly sharpened images, you're, you're going to ruin them. <coughs> now, now we're talk, that we're talking about teleconverters, I'm going to show you how I work my teleconverter. Again, speed is everything. My teleconverters are in this little pouch, and I keep it unzipped with no caps. Yes, I might get dust, but I would rather have dust than miss that picture. I can deal with the dust later. So this goes in there, right like so, with that red dot up. When it's time to put that on, I lock these down. If I don't, this will this when I start try to undo it, this is this is a totally out of control. I lock this down, I re, I come in here, I grab that, I know where that red dot is, and it's on. Now, I put it on the body first, and here's why. If I try to bring it out of here and put it on the lens first, watch. I have to line that red dot up. You see what I had to go through? Even if I didn't know where the red, even if I had that red dot, I got to get that on there. Look at my body. When I pull that thing out, I have control of both of these. It goes right on and right on. Now all I have to do is reach up here and push this <coughs> forward to the balance point. Now, uh, that's been thought out also. With the, the 1.4 on there, this is level, this right here. When I push that forward, that's the balance point, uh -oh. if, you lock, if you lock it down. Oh, and these little things on there, Oh, man, they save me all the time. <laughs> Keeps that from coming out of there. All right, this is balance. Now, if I take this off, when I take this off, and you see, I'm putting this on and putting this away at the same time, because whatever I'm shooting is not going to wait on me. Now, when I, balance point is off now. I don't want to pull it back and check it. I pull it back. It's got that little uh, safety nut in there. I pull it back, and I put my thumb right in there, and I just about that far back, lock it down, and I've hit it so I can move that fast in the field. Pull that back under there and lock it. Everything is all, it's not an accident that it, that it happens. Okay? So that, that's how I work the teleconverter right there where I can get to all that stuff. All right, here's something you have to know. Other than a, that's a grizzly bear. Let me zoom up here. Anybody know what that look, what you're looking at there? Why that's so nasty looking and out of focus? Those are heat waves. That's heat waves. There's nothing you can do about it. 
That's heat waves. I've thrown more pictures away because of heat waves than probably anything else. And heat waves could happen from here to the door. When you're photographing over water, and, and let me tell you something, sometimes you can see heat waves and sometimes you don't, but that camera will find them. That camera will find those heat waves. And when you see that look, now you're, you're and you, anybody experienced that before? Yeah, you throw those away, don't you? They're, they're no good. Did you know what it was? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Now, if you really want to see heat waves sometimes, sit in your car when it's cold outside and look with binoculars. Binoculars <laughs> are unforgiving. You will see heat waves through binoculars. All right, now, there's nothing you can do about it. If you're shooting on a, over snow and the sun comes out, you can get heat waves. It's not necessarily always heat waves, it's just atmosphere, you're shooting through atmosphere. So people say, well, you got that long lens, how far can you shoot with that? Well, infinity. But a long shot is a long shot, and the further the shot, you're shooting through more atmosphere. And the more atmosphere you're shooting through, that's what you're gonna get. So I'm gonna tell you something that we all do. And it's the worst thing we can all do. And here's another example. Here's some more heat waves. This little bird. And that bird was close. He's pretty, pretty good size in the frame. He was close. And look how mushy he is. You know why he's so mushy? That's shooting out of the car window. Shooting out of the car window, and we all have to do it for two reasons. Number one is you're lazy. And number two, you have to use the vehicle as a blind. But that's what you're going to get. Now, I see this all the time in the field. These guys jump out of their car with their bean bag, and what do they do with it? Throw it on the hood and lay that lens down there and start shooting. <coughs> no heat coming off that hood, is there? If you shoot out of the window, that's what you're going to get. Now, if it's in the winter and you know you're going to be shooting out of the window and it's really cold, you dress like you're going to be standing outside and you ride around in your car with the heater off and the windows down. Because if those windows are up and you stop to shoot and you roll those windows down, all that heat's going to pour out and you're going to be shooting right through it. That's not good. Now, if you can, if your subject sticks around, you want to sit there long enough for the motor to quit, you know, the heat from the motor to quit rising, but you have to be dressed because it's cold out and you want to be dressed like you're standing outside and shoot out of that car window like that. So I've shot, my buddy and I um, were shooting in Yellowstone, um, a grizzly sound cub shooting across the Yellowstone River and we shot a thousand frames at this grizzly sound cub, close. And when I got home, I deleted every one of them. You couldn't see that, that mirage or heat waves. You couldn't see it at all. I threw them all away. And a few days later, my friend called, and he says, I'm going to have to send my lens in the can and get it worked on. I said, yeah, you deleted all those bear pictures, didn't you? He said, well, how'd you know? I said, well, what took you so long? I deleted mine two days ago. <laughs> we were shooting across that river, and you'll see the same thing when you're photographing ducks. You'll come home, they'll be soft. Oh, it, but let me tell you one other thing I've learned. Shoot it anyway. It, shoot it anyway, especially if the wind is blowing. Shoot bursts. Shoot a rapid burst and wait. Shoot a rapid burst and wait. Because if you shoot a burst of, let's say, 10 or 15, one of those will be dead tack sharp. Because as that wind is blowing that, that uh, atmosphere, somewhere in there there'll be a break. And you won't know it or you won't see it, but that, shoot it anyway. Don't just, I used to look at it and go, oh, man, this is nasty. But on a hot day, it, is, it isn't going to go away. It's just time to hunker down. Oh, and shooting out of the car. 
I don't use a bean bag. I use this. I used to use these things right here. This is what, uh, it's got tape around it, but yeah, this is uh, pipe insulation. And I would, it's already split, and I would put that in there. But what happens is the window will cut that, and they won't last very long. Well, we were in Texas photographing birds, and in this one area where we were, every fence post had a hawk or a falcon on it, and I was shooting everything out of the car, and that thing wore out. Well, I went in the hardware store to buy some more of this padding, and walking down the aisle, and I saw that, and you'll have to split it. You'll have to put some good gloves on so you don't cut your hand by accident, get you a good razor, and you'll split that. Somebody will be using this when you're gone. This thing, will, it will last forever. Now, it, all it's going to do when you lay that camera up there, it's going to take the weight off the camera. It's your job to hold it steady. And then you're going to use either the seat or the window up and down to adjust your camera. But that's, that's how I shoot out of the car window. And when you fly with it, they might go through your luggage. Okay, here's a tripod you want to buy. That's this tripod right here. Now this tripod is discontinued. I will give, I tried to look it up today on B&H website to see what took its place. There's another one that took its place. I'm going to give you the number for this in case you're interested. And I'm going to tell you why you want one this tall. This one is GT3541. XLS GT three five four one XLS. Now, when I first bought a second Getsu tripod, the first one had a center column, and I, I liked the center column um, only so I could get up um, high and down quickly. But what happened with the long lens when I you have that up a little bit, and you take this, and you put it over your shoulder, that shaft, that carbon fibers will splinter in that shaft. And it's holding this base in there. And the only thing holding that base in there is friction. There's no pin. There's nothing. So when that carbon fiber splinters, you're going to lose everything. So it, it, unless you have an aluminum tripod, you don't want a center shaft. Well, I wanted the center shaft so I could get up and down quickly. Well, here's a technique to get up and down quickly. If I have a, a bird that's right here, and the mate comes in, and the mate is up there, I don't want to have to do this. You just pull these legs in. Now, it's not as wide, but all it's doing is taking the weight off the camera. It's still steady. You're going to take that technique I showed you in, in the beginning, and you're going to shoot. And then when it's time to go back to this one, you're down. You're back on this one again. That's how you... And then if you had uneven ground and you happen to set your tripod down, you walk up, there's your subject, And let's say you set your tripod down and you're on uneven ground and you have to start shooting right away. You don't have, don't mess around with this. Start shooting. Bring that leg in and shoot. You just leveled it. And then if your subject stays there and you get a break, then take time to adjust it. But not when you first get started. Or you could even have one longer than the other as you're walking. When I'm walking and one's longer than the other, that's when I even them out while I'm walking. And I get there and I set it down on uneven ground. That's how I level it up. Pull that leg in. And if it's still whopper jawed, pull the other one in. Until, and I just look at the base right here to see if I'm relatively level. And when you get a, when you get a moment, then you level them up. Then you, you know, then you, and another trick that I learned, if you're shooting in deep snow and you walk up, let's say that snow's this deep, 
and you're on the road and they plowed and it's real deep out here and you set that tripod down in that snow when those legs go in that snow they'll start to go out and that snow will bend this leg and you'll have, you might snap the joint you probably have experienced that before as it goes down that snow binds these joints when you get in deep snow you pull your legs in and then when you set it down in the snow they will take themselves out without putting a bind in those joints okay thank you guys it was wonderful thank you, thank you.